we can say confidently today that the PDP uh, campaign has collapsed. And the PDP as a party has also collapsed. The various components of PDP in 2019 are the ones pulling out of that coalition. Nothing has affected the APC. If you look at 2019, go back and look at 2019. Every single component of that coalition they formed, both inside and outside the party against the APC, have virtually collapsed. The PANDEF endorsed Article 2019. Edwin Clark is a member of the PANDEF. Ohanese endorsed Article in 2019. Obasanjo endorsed Article in 2019. Uh, Afeni Ferre endorsed that article in 2019. Middle Belt Forum endorsed that article in 2019. I know all of these groups. I was a, the returning officer to Mr. President and the APC in 2019 at the International Conference Center. So I, of course, we are very much concerned about the results coming from different parts of the country. And I can tell you the results, you know, off by heart. So I know clearly when we said, I mean, even though we said in a comical way, but it is true, that the jungle will mature for the PDP. What is going on now, Chiu, is that the PDP has virtually been turned to straight, both internally by the G5, and um, we hear there's a G1 now joining the G5, and also the sympathizers of the party in 2019. They have, the party have imploded both inside and imploded even within, you know, the, the supporters and the, uh, all, all the all those who form some kind of uh, alliance with the PDP. I want to ask you something, Shewan, and I want everybody, all Nigerians, to please put this in proper context. Of the results in 2019 and what happened in 2019, can you tell me one major stakeholder, one, not two, one, major stakeholder that won, that helped us to win the election in 2019? Either as a party stalwart, is that a party stalwart or as uh, perhaps uh, a governor of the party, a sympathizer of the party that won the election in 2019 that has pulled out now and said they are not supporting us? Not one. Not one. But PDP, the various factors we have now that have upset the political terrain which is Peter Obi and Kwan Kwan So. They were the components of PDP in 2019. Those are the two major factors now that have upset the political terrain now. The entry of Peter Obi and, of course, the NMPP, Kwan Kwan So. Those two factors here, who were they part of in 2019? So we can confidently say that the wheels of PDP are falling off one by one, both internally and externally, the PDP has collapsed. So the recent endorsement of Edwin Clark, for me, I don't take the view, you know, that some of my, even my, my colleagues took against Obama and your, you know, pillory him. And I'm excited by these endorsements. I'm excited by the endorsement of Peter, of Abbas and your against Atiku and for Peter Obi, because the endorsement of, of Abbas and your is not against APC. It's against Atiku, because he supported Atiku in 2019. He was also a boss to Atiku. Like, if you understand, if you heard what uh, Yeson Wiko said, he said, it is a tragedy that your former boss, who should mark your scripts, who should give you a pass mark, has decided to endorse somebody else. In other words, a boss and just endorsement of that ticket in 2019 was because of Peter Obi. Was that because of Atiku? So, right now, Obama Sanjo has followed Atiku, has followed Peter Obi away from PDP, has followed him to a, to, to, to a Labour Party. Edwin Clark, who endorsed Atiku in 2019, has followed Peter Obi from PDP to Labour Party. What is the effect on, on, the, on the APC? It has just made the path to our victory clearer. As I speak today to you, I'm not going to sound overconfident. But there's no time that the results of 2023 has become clearer and obvious to everybody than these endorsements that are coming. We're excited by them. We want them, these endorsements will have the effect, the required effect that it should have, which is the fact that those votes they brought into PDP in 2019, they should take those votes away now and take them to the Labour Party. All right. While the APC continues to work stronger.
So let me, let me ask you, because there are um, permutations here and there where the G5 governors of the PDP, the uh, integrity governors of the PDP, where they, they will um, apply their trade or where they will, they will be supporting for the presidential election. Because we have heard uh, Governor Wike, who had clearly told his supporters in the live television uh, uh, telecast that, look, uh, support so so the PDP in as a governor, support so so uh, the PDP uh, for Senate, and not, but for uh, the, uh, the presidential race, he said they will come back to them to tell them. Now, uh, one of those uh, G5 governors is Governor Samuel Autumn, who said, if I were not, these are his words, if I were not a member of the PDP, I will be following you everywhere to converse vote for you. He was taking, telling the Pete, uh, Peter Obi, but I understand that there was some excitement within your camp that the G5 vote or the G5 are siding with you guys. Now, with indication coming from the mouth of Governor Autumn, it doesn't look, it looks to me like he's in the negative. No. So, look, I, I want to let all Nigerians know this, including the APC supporters especially. We want to make our, we want to address our base. Either way the G5 goes, it's a win-win situation for the APC. Either way. Because this G5 is a component of the PDP. It's a strong component of the PDP. They are, they are governors of the PDP. So if they go to Peter Obi, win-win for APC. If they come to us, plus again, win-win. Anywhere they go, except Atiku, is a win-win for us. Because even the votes they are taking to Labour Party will also not give victory to Labour Party. Look, the, the, the praise we are having for Labour Party is in a, con it's a contextual kind of praise. It's not the kind of praise that we think they will use to win the election. It is just the type of, the type of praise, the type of hype, that is contextual in the sense that this is a young party. It will be winding there in the last five or six months or seven months, okay? And they are doing well, better than expected. It's not that people will expect them to win. No, Labour Party will not win. I can bet with anything that is precious to me on earth. I can tell you, and I'm that, that confident. I put it down that they will not win. But it's in a context. I mean, flip it, flip it to the other way around. Flip it the other way around. Say, APC, for example, wakes up tomorrow. They lose support of all 21 governors. They don't have any governor supporting. They don't have any senator supporting them. They cannot fill all senatorial. They can only fill only 30% of senatorial seats. That is what Labour Party has been able to do, about 30% of senatorial seats and House of Rep seats. They don't have candidates in more than about 70% of the seats. Okay? So flip it tomorrow and that happens to Ross APC. And then that three elder statesmen are the only ones and does it not. Pade Banjo, uh, Obasanjo, Edwin Clark. That that is the only support APC, you know, wakes up tomorrow to see on the ground. People will say we have failed. As a party, people will say APC has failed. How will you not have support or candidates in 70% of, you know, senatorial seats or House of Rep seats? How will you not have support of any governor? Because these are structures in party that deliver elections. If you flip it tomorrow, you know that AP, you will say APC has failed. But why are they not saying that Labour Party has failed? That's why the fact that these are the very porous kind of support they have is because that for the short time that Peter Obi has gone there, they have done well. So it's in a context. It's not that people expect them to win. No. The race before now has actually been between the APC and the PDP. But as I speak to you now today, PDP has collapsed, completely collapsed. If you look at 2019, and look at now, 2023, you know, demography does not change drastically overnight. Remember, I use the word advisedly, drastically. There's, there are some settled demography of this country. And since the numbers are not adding up again in the South for PDP, they have lost South is virtually, it's our big factor, South South with the destruction of, of uh, West Yes Wiki and the rise of APC in the South South. I'm called the Southwest that has, you know, as you are on the ticket that we have always won the Southwest since 2015. I mean, put together. Okay? Now, the numbers are not adding up for them. Now, if you look at their campaign so far, the PDP will continue to tell you that they are hoping, it's just hope upon hope, that there will be some kind of upheaval in the North, some kind of reversal of fortune. They are just some, some kind of betrayal of Ashiwaju. All their hopes rest on the betrayal of the APC. All right. 
So in let me. Case, yeah. Yeah. So That's let me. Yeah. So let me. Uh, you you you're saying endorsement, but some of these endorsements have come also with a markdown uh, for those who did not get the endorsement, especially your party. Uh, if I take uh, some of the words of uh, Chief Edwin Clark before I go to f uh, former, or maybe I should even in fact go to former President Obasanjo, uh, you are a seven minister. Uh, you, I mean, your party has been in power for the last seven and a half years. And this is what President Ob Obasanjo said. He said, the last seven and a half years have no doubt been eventful and stressful years for many Nigerians. We have moved from frying pan to fire and from mountaintop to the valley. Uh, I went further to say that our, our leaders have done their best, but their best have turned out to be the best for, uh, for Nigeria and Nigerians at home and abroad. For most Nigerians, it was hell on earth. This is how a former president, whom you will also say is the boss of your principal in the military, and he has marked him down, if perhaps, if you look at it, zero. Very simple. Worst words and phrases were used against us by these same people in 2019. And 50 million Nigerians did not listen to them. They voted for us. Obasan just said worst things about Buhari in 2019. He said he was poor in economic management of the country. The economy had collapsed. He said those very untruthful things. This is not a program for me to begin to debunk each and everything that he has said. Because he ran a government that was worst. He ran a government that could not build infrastructure despite earnings. He ran a government that was really worse in terms of the rule of law, that they were removing governors at night. They were removing people, you know, from office in arbitrarily. We woke up one morning and Obasa just government published a list of politicians that were banned. Let's focus on the performance of your government be yeah, so, because that exactly. is more important. So, no, no, now, no, no, let's leave no, history. No, Some no, of the no, history no, are accounting are probably no, not even, they don't matter to 18-year-old uh, new, new, new voters. He said that your government has not delivered, that your government has led to Ni Nigeria from frying pan to fire, and that is, is, uh, is marking of the performance of your government. That they voted for <laughs> you in 2019, does it make your government Government right in the, uh, in the sight of the right thinking Nigerians who voted for them that they've delivered, you have delivered on the promises you made to Nigerians. We are, make, we are taking that statement in the context of the weight the endorsement carries and the type of people that can sway not to vote for us. Because, like I said, going into that statement, I was just going into it to stop me. Because it can take one hour for me to go sector by sector to show that we have done better than Obasanjo's government. That's a long way to go. But I can tell you that the short way to go in this interview is to say, what weight does that endorsement carry, Shewo? What weight? He said the same things in 2019. 15 million Nigerians did not listen to him. Edwin Clark said the same thing in 2019. 15 million Nigerians did not listen to him. Don't forget that in 2019, they talked about the health of Mr. President. They said he could not carry on with his health. Today, he's stronger than most of them. In 2019, they said the economy had collapsed. People did not listen to them because they knew that we were honest enough to tell Nigerians where we were and where we were going. They talked about every single thing they are talking about now. So that's the point I'm making, therefore, that in the context of what you are saying, the context of how does this endorsement or the pillaring of our administration, how does it affect the voters? And I'm telling you that it does not Affect it in any way at all. Okay, so let, let's put this in, a, in another context, uh, Minister. Yeah. Now, if you look yeah. at it just for a moment, if you look at it again, yeah. you are a politician and you are a father. First, as yes. a politician, when you go back to your, uh, because they say every politics is local, if you go back home, your constituents will be asking what you have brought for them, either in terms of the immediate cash you're given to them or the project or whatever you are bringing to their, to, their, to their zone or their territory. Now, as a father, when you're coming back home, your children will be thinking if you have paid their school fees or you're bringing food to their table. Now, to a larger context, Nigerians will be looking at where you, I mean, you met Nigeria and what is, 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 is ongoing right now, what is obtainable. You look at the inflation rate, it was at 9%. Now it's over 20%. Unemployment rate, it was 8% before you came into power. It was, three, it's now 33.3%. 3 
death profile has risen. I mean, there are debates over uh, what culminates into that. Let's put that aside. What about exchange rate? What, how much did you mean the dollar? Now, the dollar is way almost 700 and something at, at, the, at the parallel market. Now, you look at a whole lot of indices that are not looking very well. And your presidential campaign council has chosen the slogan of renewed hope. See what the opposition has said about that slogan. They said it is a slogan coming from a realization of failure that want to salvage the situation. So what do you tell Nigerians that, oh, we met these things at single digits when we came into office, but now it's at double digit. Is the life, are the lives of Nigerians better when, now than when you met it? These are the questions they will be asking. Let me tell you where we met, let me tell you where we met Nigeria in 2015. We met Nigeria at a point where the economy was loose diving and collapsing. Who said so? Not we. It was Okonjo Iweala that said so. The Minister of uh, Finance of the, of the PDP government. A few months to hand over, she warned that the economy was more diving. At that time, don't forget that the GDP had collapsed from 6.5 to 2.2 or 2.5. That was where, that was how, that was the, that was the downward trend of the economy at that time. Why? Because they failed to make very useful, you know, useful investment of all the earnings that they earned in the 16 years of government. That is the effect we are feeling today. And what we are doing is trying to revive the economy. The economy is on an upward trend, no doubt about it. I'll give you the indices to prove that. But you are asking me specifically where we met the economy, where we met this country. And I'm telling you, where we met it because it was not by my own Ipsy Dixit, it was by the Ipsy Dixit. I'm sorry, I'm using a legal term. By the word of their own finance minister, Chewu, not me. She said at that time that whoever, hands up, whoever inherited the government, that whoever went, won was going to face a recession. She said we're headed for a recession, not me. So are you going to attribute all that to the APC? So what we came, what we came on a rescue mission. The rescue mission continues. The damage PDP did to God this country in the last 60 years cannot be, cannot be easily remedied. Look at all the infrastructural, you talk about loans. Look at what we have used all our loans to do. You can virtually see them. You can see them. You can see the rails. You can see the bridges. You can see the roads. Tell me one, one, not two, one infrastructural development that the PDP engaged in in 60 years when they were in power. They only talk about some very, you know, ephemeral kind of achievement. Mr. Kiyamu, they just for a about... moment. Apologies, I have to pause it for a moment because we need to All take right. a commercial break. And when we come back, the side of, uh, or the part of the, um, your slogan, which the opposition said, renewed hope just means that it's failure trying to salvage the situation. How do you explain to Nigerians that for seven and a half years, you're on a rescue mission and they should vote for your party again? That conversation will continue after this break, everyone. Join us again. Does. We're focusing on uh, the state of the race. If the ruling APC is now comfortable with the endorsement that we're seeing and how they hope to convince Nigerians as the ruling party going into the presidential race. Mr. Fessor Skeyamo, senior advocate of Nigeria, who is the uh, spokesperson of the APC presidential campaign council, has been speaking with me from Florida in the United States. Thank you so much, Lennon Sik, for joining us tonight. Um, I, I, I caught in into that uh, line of thought, uh, the question I asked you, and how you are able to defend uh, the performance of the APC, and uh, the words of the opposition saying, renewed hope alone as a slogan is an acceptance or the realization of failure of the APC knowing that they've not been able to accomplish what they have promised Nigerians. So what would you be telling Nigerians that after seven and a half years, we have failed you, but still vote us into office, we will do better? So, like I was saying, I was just, you know, uh, going through my train of thoughts. I talked about what Okonjo Oweala, their own finance minister, said at the point of handover. Now, not only that, two central bank governors that served the PDP Go back and look at their speeches in 2014 and to early 2015. Soludo is alive, who is now the governor of Anambra State, and Mohamed Sanusi, the former, you know, uh, the Emir of Kano. Both of them said whoever wins the 2015 election was going to inherit a mess. I did not say so. So when the PDP spokespersons they come on air 
and they begin to rant about how where they left the economy and all that. Refer them back to what their own people said. Not our people. We're not people in opposition. People who serve their own government. Their central bank governors and their finance minister said whoever won the 2015 election was going to inherit a mess. So, so it is not a doubt, therefore, that we inherited a mess. And we have been on that rescue mission for seven and a half years. But you and told, me, you told Nigerians you can get the job done. That's why Nigerians, I, you I wish that you were going to get the job done. That's why Nigerians so, voted for so, your party. So, are you not seeing infrastructure? We inherited, we inherited a bridge, a second Niger bridge, on drawing paper, on paper. You're asking me what we heard. That's what we inherited. A paper, paper, on paper for 16 years. It has been completed. We, we inherited so many, you know, power projects on the paper. The Zungeru, the Kasimbila power project on paper. They are now completed, bringing 4,000 megawatts back to the national grid. Those are the things we inherited. All of these economic issues in this you're talking about, they are sweeping across the globe. Go and see the IMF prediction. IMF prediction says the biggest countries in the world are going to face bigger crises in 2023. What it means is that we have been able to manage our economy to a manageable level in, term, in, you know, in, in the face of global economic meltdown. This indices we are seeing could have been worse. It shows one, first of all, that we were left in a mess. We are still trying to clean up the mess. The mess was not going to be cleaned up by the freak of the switch. Mr. Kiyamo, I, I, I wish that we could move on quickly because there are a few other areas I'd like to touch. But, okay. I mean, one thing that would be very critical, just like PDP came to town and said, we failed Nigerians, and they were begging, uh, they were apologizing. And I hope that tonight, I won't sit here and be a judge. That's not my job. My job is a journalist who presents the facts and asks the questions to uh, those who are in office as enshrined in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and I like to do so. Now, the question is whether there is a realization that wrongs have been done, where there, uh, there are a lot of things that have been done right equally, but in several critical areas. Now, in your own time on government, your, I mean, Nigeria became um, uh, the, the, uh, the poverty capital of the world. In your own time, under this government, your own government agency said that Nigeria is now more, uh, 133 million Nigerians are multidimensionally poor. The unemployment rate is at 8% before you came into, into office. It's now 33.3%. Now, inflation rate is 9, was 9%, is now 20.77%. Honorable Minister, how do you justify that? Is there a point where your party or this government will tell Nigerians, we've failed in this area, we've succeeded in this area, apologize and tell Nigerians how it could be done better? Is there any point that you can come clean to Nigerians? Can you give me three minutes to answer this? I'll give you and one I minute. To tell you this. Because I, I have to, some other yes, areas I would, I would like to talk. I want to tell you this. These figures you are talking about do not apply only to the federal government. So, people are, they are deceiving everybody. It applies to PPP governments in the states and APC governments too. The multidimensional poverty, we were the ones, we, it was not an external body, we were the ones who commissioned that report. And the multidimensional poverty shows that if not, well, not monetary poverty, not in terms of money in the pockets of people, the access people have to social infrastructure that makes their life you know, better, that improves their life. And those social infrastructure, education, clean water, health, good uh, you know, hygiene, on and on like that. Those factors, those indices, are indices that are provided by multi levels of government, by local government, by state government, and by, of course, some the federal government. And most of them, are domiciled in the local government and state government. So we brought it out to show that other levels of government can do better in terms of provision of social infrastructure to the people of Nigeria. The way commissioned it to show Nigerian people that they can, they should hold their own representatives at the lower levels of government, they should hold them liable for some of those things they cannot get. Somebody turns on the tap, he cannot get water. Oh, Buhari is bad. That is the work, that is local government. Provision of such basic and amenities. Primary education is local government. You cannot go to a school, you say, oh, federal government. No. So we commission the multidimensional poverty affects all levels of government, especially the other two tiers of government. So let us educate the people better. It is not Buhari, it's not federal government. It's not APC government. No. It is all levels of government involving 
Okay. Yeah. So let's move on. We, we can be at it all, yes. all day because, I mean, I yes. live amongst the very poor and I understand uh, their plight. So let's move on. We can be at this all day uh, because there are all yeah. indices that speak to this matter. Now, let's look at what Chief Edwin Clark said. There are inferences you can draw from what he said. And he says that he's talking about capacity, competence, and agility. He said, we do not need, I mean, we need a leader. I don't want to go back into all that th those things he, he said. You heard what he said. And this applies to those he did not endorse, especially those who are the heavyweights in the race. Now, how do you defend, in fact, the from, former President Obasan, you also mentioned, in fact, the former president also criticized the Emilocan factor that was now made popular by your candidate that is a sign of uh, uh, entitlement, which he has been criticized. Now, in a, let me first of all clear that in the local uh, slogan. And we have said it over and over, and it appears that, you know, the PDP people, they appear like a cheating students in an example who cram questions, cram answers, who have seen the answers and they cram it to the example. They memorize it. So when you get to the example, the question changes, but they are still pouring the same answers down. That is why they are not listening to our explanation. We said in a Milocon, we was not talking to Nigerians. He was speaking to delegates, APC delegates in Ogun states, where he said, look, if you want to say those who have invested in this party, those who have supported because who have built this party, it is my turn. Give me the chance to fly the flag of this party. Was he talking to Nigerians? He was not. But yet, they keep repeating it 1,000 times so that they will look as if he was talking to Nigerians and claiming some kind of, you know, uh, moral high ground or some kind of entitlement. But then, Obasanjo too, he was also using a Miloko in another sense. He was saying that it is the turn of some other people to produce the presidency. And that was why he was saying it is their turn. And that's why he's endorsing somebody else. That is what he's saying. That for equity, for justice, it was the same thing that uh, by, uh, uh, I see what you were saying now. Within the delegate, so the delegate said, for equity and for justice, I have done more. Give me the chance. He is also now saying, for equity and justice, somebody also deserves it. He's also saying that our local, it's the same thing he's saying in another way. So, Pastor Josh should not be so sanctimonious. Speak, because uh, Minister, all. speak to yes. the issue of agility and age that was that has been uh, drawn into this matter. They gave their so, reasons. So, uh, so, Chief so, Edwin Clark so, actually gave his reason. He said he needs agility have, and age, can, someone whose age is on his side. Can, can, do you remember Morgan's Vangara? Morgan's Vangara. Absolutely, absolutely. Good. Do you remember his major campaign in Zimbabwe then? His major campaign point was that he was in the early 60s, he was late 50s to early 60s, he was agile, he was more, you know, he was more, you know, fit, fit, physically and all of that. And that then Robert Mugabe, who was in his late 80s, was not fit to, to rule Zimbabwe on the basis of health. What happened, Cheo? Morgan's Vangarai collapsed suddenly and died. And the same person he was talking about, which is Robert Mugabe, outlived him for close to 10 years. The same person. So it is a shock to see such elderly people come and talk about health when they don't, they cannot show Nigerians some kind of medical records. It is such a poor, you know, representation of what they stand for and the, even the, the kind of age and wisdom they should have. Can they say that the age that they have now, we pray for more life for them. My father, Edwin Clark, I pray for him to get to 100, 110, and the boss and your two, who is also from my maternal home state of good state. I pray for them. But then can they say that the good health they enjoy was as a result of their own making? Are you, asking, are you asking leaders to now present their, their health report? Is that what you're saying? Of course. If, you, if it comes to that, if it comes to that, because what is wrong with our candidates? Absolutely nothing. Would you, See, would, you, you be, would your candidate be no, willing to do hold that? On, hold on. Are you a, if are you're you saying that, would your candidate be doing that? Are you a medical practitioner? If there's any indication, except there's, there's no, if there's any indication, of course he will. But there's no indication. Where's the indication? Tell me what's the indication. There's nothing. Has he collapsed? Has he fainted? 
what is the problem? I still don't know. So they are pandering to base sentiment. So why do you think, Mr. Kayama, why do you think that... Mr. repeat something you, times, Mr. Kayama, just a moment. Why do you think that there is a very popular or there is a growing concern about the agility of your candidate? And no why do you concern. think this is a major point of conversation? There is no growing concern. It is, a, it is the trick of, of propaganda to repeat something 1,000 times and begin to say, if I begin to tell Nigerians now about Shehu and I trump, it's just like when they said uh, Buhari was a uh, Jubrin, Jubrin of uh, somebody. Remember that it came as a complete joke. We all laughed over it. But it got to a point when pastors climbed their pulpits and begin to begin to began to ask, is that the real Buhari in Asoro? Until the president was forced to respond, until we were forced to respond. That is the kind of nonsense that can stick as truth if you mention it a thousand times. So, as I speak with you, the opposition has nothing to campaign. So let me let, let, so let's let, let's truth. wrap. Yeah. So repeat it a thousand times. Yeah. Let's wrap up speak, this conversation. Let's truth. look at the possibility because I do know that no matter what, I mean, the, the confidence that uh, you you're showing tonight, uh, your party is under intense pressure, and so we will are it not. be. We are not. Just allow me to land, please, just a moment. Yes. Uh, uh, you might say you are not, but some of We're us not. cannot be fooled because in any race, whether it's politics, sports, even academics, even what, if, if you are uh, in a class and you are sitting for an examination, you'll be under some, some kind of pressure. Even those of us who speak on live television every day, there is the natural tendency of stage fright. That is natural. It's by nature. So either you agree or not, there is intense pressure within the APC. You want to win this election. How many states, for example, you have said that it's the PDP that is at the loss based on this endorsement. But tonight, for example, in uh, the Southeast, for example, how many states do you think you can win? Can you give me just three minutes? I'm begging for three we minutes. Don't so have that, we, we don't have the luxury of Analysis time. for you. Because <laughs> I don't want to guide me the way. Let me, let me just give you a, a, an overall, overall perspective of where we're going. And we are, I have sat down in our war room and we have made our projections. The numbers are not adding up for PDP at all. And for us, it will be the eleventh wonder of the world if there's anything like that. I'm sorry, I'm not going to sound overconfident, but I'm just sounding, you know, based on projections and, you know, demography. So I'm not going to sound arrogant or confident before Nigerians. But the point is that it will be the eleventh wonder if we don't win the election. The truth of the matter is that look at the demography of Nigeria. Like I told you when we started this program, the 20, between 2019 and 2023, what is going to change drastically? It is the entry of two different people to the election, which is Obi and Kwan Kwan so. Who did they support in 2019? Who is losing as a result of their coming into the context? That will answer your question. Secondly, are you going to say that I want to give you an expo and this expo, I will release it a week to voting time to show you how the figures are adding up so well for us. Look at the 2015 elections. Put it in one hand, like you say, have the 2015 in one hand. Look at the 2019 elections. Look at the loss and gains we suffered between 2015 and 2019. Look at that demography. Now, take those same losses and gains and apply it to 20, 2019 and 2023. In those states where we lost, apply the same percentage of loss. In those states where we gain, apply the same percentage. Because demography does not change overnight. Uh, Especially when major issues are not changed for you. Mr. So Kiyama, we're, we're totally out of time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you I'll come back into the country... What example if I go? Well, well, no, 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 because we are totally out of time. When you come yeah. back to the country, I would like you yeah. to take a pen and a paper, and we we'll have to do some analysis. <laughs> At that time, you may have to that get some political now. science tutoring uh, from me right here in this studio when you come back at that time. Thank you so much, Mr. Fessor Skiamo, for joining us. All right, thank us. you. The spokesperson of the APC-PCC. Thank you so much indeed for joining us.